Welcome back, Year 5. In today's reading lesson, we are starting our new book, and it is a book of stories. So, when we read Fantastic Mr. Fox, it was the same story over a period of weeks. What we're going to do now is read from a book of stories that has a ton of different little stories in it. So each day that I read, I'll be reading you a new story from that book. I'm going to show you the cover of that book in a second, but first, our learning intention. Today we are going to respond to questions about a text using text evidence and connections. Now we've worked on making connections before, but we will be reviewing that in a moment. Now, as promised, let me show you the cover of the book. So this is the book that we'll be reading from. It's called Silly Stories, and it was actually written by several authors because the stories were sometimes written by different people. Those people are Andy Charman, Heather Henning, Beatrice Philpotts, Caroline Repchuk, Louisa Somerville, and Christine Tagg. So please bear in mind, none of these stories were written by me. I'll show you the um, title page with all those authors' names in a moment. It was also illustrated by Diana Catchpole, Robin Edmonds, Chris Forsey, and Claire Mumford, and it has some wonderful pictures in it, which you'll be seeing very soon. Now, before we dig into the book, as I said, we're going to review what it means to make connections. That way, when it comes time for your independent work, you know exactly what to do. So, first of all, what are connections? Well, a connection is when you relate what you've read to something that you've experienced or seen or felt for yourself. There are three types of connections, text to self, text to text, and text to world. Let's start with text to self connections. These are when you are connecting the story to your own life, experiences, and feelings. When you're making a text to self connection, you might find that you start by saying, this reminds me of, or I understand how the character feels because the setting makes me think about another place or I experienced this myself when... So all of these sentence starters lead you into telling a story about something that you have personally experienced that is a lot like what you read in the text. Now what about text-to-text -text connections? These are when you are connecting the characters, setting, or events from one story to another story that you've also read. So some ways that you might find yourself making a text-to-text -text connection are when you say, the character in this story is like the character in, or the setting in this story is the same as the setting in, this event is like when, these two stories are like because, so all of those sentence starters lead you into relating one story or text to another. Finally, text to world connections. This is when you are connecting the story to world history and events. Now, text to world connections also incorporate text to media connections. They are things that you have seen through maybe um, the news or a textbook, but not, not necessarily a story, but it's something that you've learned about the world through the media somehow. When you're making these kinds of connections, you might say, this happened in real life when or this is like something I heard on the news, this happened when, or this story is similar to. So these connections, they're not relating to things that specifically happened to you. It might have happened to someone else or somewhere else in the world, but you are aware of it because perhaps you watched the news or you heard the story from someone else. Now I'm going to show you an example of how I can make each of these types of connections. All of the connections that I'm going to make are going to be to this picture. So take a moment to study this picture, see what you gather from it. Think to yourself if it reminds you of anything before you hear what my connections are. Here's my text to self connection. This image reminds me of when soldiers came to Cayman after Hurricane Ivan. I remember waiting in the line at the supermarket with my parents when I was a child, and the soldiers had huge guns. It made me afraid to see them there, so I imagine that the boy in the picture must be afraid too. In this case, my text-to-self connection helps me to understand what the boy in the picture might be feeling. I related it to event an event that I experienced when I also saw soldiers with large guns. Now, in this picture, it seems that there's a war going on. I didn't experience a war, so I couldn't make a connection in that way. However, I have experienced seeing soldiers, so that's where my connection came in. Let's look now at a text-to-text -text connection. 
for my text-to-text -text connection, you'll likely recognize the text that I'm connecting to. I said, this image reminds me of the story Oranges in No Man's Land, because there was a war going on and the main character, Aisha, came across several soldiers during the story. She felt fearful when she saw the soldiers because she knew they killed people who weren't on their side, so this boy might be afraid when he sees the soldiers too. Again, I used my connection to help me understand how the boy in the picture is feeling, a lot like how I could use a connection to help me understand how a character in a book is feeling. In this case, I made a connection to another text that had a similar setting. Now, although this says text to text connection, I'm aware that I'm looking at a picture and relating it to a text. But this is a good example of what it's like to make a text to text connection. Because when you're reading, you're imagining something happening in your brain, the author has developed the setting for you, developed the characters, and you can then relate it to another text. So in my case, it's a bit of a picture to text connection, but you get the idea. And you know what happened in Oranges in No Man's Land, so you can probably understand how I came up with this connection. Finally, my text to world connection. Again, I am aware that I'm not really connecting a text here, it's a picture, but you get the idea. I said, this image reminds me of news reports I heard on TV about wars going on in the Middle East. The reporters explain that many children are suffering because of the wars. Some children have lost their homes and even family members. Many of them don't get to do normal things like go to school or play outside because of the war. The boy in the picture is probably experiencing some of the things I heard on the news. Now, this connection helped me to understand the situation of the boy a bit better. As you can see, I put quite a bit of detail into this connection. I explained what I saw on the news and how it related to the picture. I also elaborated by giving some background, what m the boy might be experiencing. When you make connections like this when you're reading, it really helps you understand how a character is feeling and why they might act the way that they do. So making connections is a very powerful skill as a reader. We're going to practice that today as we read our first story from our book of silly stories. All right, as promised, here is that title page with the names of the authors and illustrators. So just to reiterate, I did not come up with these stories. They are not mine. They are from these authors and illustrators. Today we'll be reading a story called Denture Adventure. Take a look at the picture. Who do you think the story is going to be about? Well, let's see. Denture Adventure. Grandad's teeth grinned broadly as they sat in the glass on the bedside table, next to his spectacles and a dish full of peanuts. Grandad snored while a large African gray parrot sat on the brass bedstead directly above Grandad's head. At precisely 7.30, it opened its beak and screeched, Wakey, wakey! Very, very loudly. Grandad stretched out his hand and, without opening his eyes, patted the parrot on the head. The parrot was quiet for exactly nine minutes, and then he began again. Before I move on to the next page, I want you to comment down below. What are spectacles? Take a look at the sentence that they appear in, and take a look at the picture, and write your answer in the comments. Wakey wakey! He called in a deafening screech. This continued until 7.57, when Grandad sat up in bed, yawned a gummy yawn, and handed the parrot a peanut. Grandad stumbled out of bed, put on his slippers, and tripped across the hall to the bathroom. A face not unlike that of a turtle gazed back at him from the mirror. A turtle in Grandad's striped pajamas. Oh dear, oh dear, he said, gazing at his curious reflection. Better put my teeth in. Back in Grandad's bedroom, Norman the African Grey Parrot had similar thoughts, and was sitting proudly on the bedstead sporting Grandad's false teeth which he had helped himself to from the glass whilst Grandad had been in the bathroom. "'Who's a pretty boy, then?' he screeched, and then the teeth fell out and dropped down behind the bed. "'Oh, bother,' said Grandad, fishing around for them with the end of his best walking stick. But the teeth seemed to have vanished into thin air. Grandma was in the kitchen making a large apple pie for tea. "'They can't have gone far,' she said, as Grandad explained what had happened." and wiping her flowery arms on her flowery apron, she climbed up the stairs to help him look. "'Men never look properly,' she said, getting down on both knees and reaching as far as she could under the big brass bed. 
she pulled out an old stripy sock with a hole in the toe, a furry mint humbug, and a Christmas card from Auntie Beryl. But the teeth were nowhere to be found. Never mind, said Grandma. I think there's an old pair in the dressing table. There was. Grandma pulled them out, triumphantly. Grandad smiled a gummy smile. My old teeth, he said fondly, and popped them into his mouth. But oh dear, oh dear, the teeth were very, very loose. They danced up and down and wobbled from side to side, and when he spoke, all that came out was a whistle, whistle, click. Whistle, whistle, click, exclaimed Norman the parrot, feeling rather proud that he had at last taught his elderly owner how to speak parrot. Oh well, said Grandma, on her way back down the stairs. You'll have to get some new ones. Grandad followed her. Today of all days, he moaned, and put the old teeth on the kitchen table. For the day of all days was today, and today was the day of the annual village show, a very big day indeed for Grandad, who had spent several long months making a magnificent rocking horse, which he had entered in one of the craft classes. You'll just have to not smile today, suggested Grandma, not very helpfully, as she lay a large pastry blanket over the fat wedges of juicy apple. Or talk, she added. Grandad shrugged his narrow shoulders and ambled over to his potting shed, feeling rather sorry for himself. Hmm, I wonder, said Grandma as she gazed at the false teeth sitting on the edge of her table. She picked them up thoughtfully, and then very carefully and very neatly, she crimped the edge of her apple pie with them. Grandad stood in the shed, flicking a duster over the shiny dappled neck of a fine rocking horse. He stood back to admire his work. The horse was perfect in every detail. A real leather saddle and bridle, a silken mane and tail, neat glossy black hooves, and two large brown eyes with wonderful long lashes. Grandad rubbed his bristly chin and frowned. Something was missing and he couldn't quite work out what it was. The nostrils were finely carved and painted a fiery red. The muzzle was sanded to the smoothest finish and a polished silver bit rested in the horse's mouth. But the mouth itself looked rather sad. Then Grandad had a splendid idea. He collected his teeth from the kitchen table and took them back to the shed. He glued them carefully into position. They were a perfect fit! Grandad stood back and grinned a gummy grin, and the rocking horse grinned a toothy one. What a brilliant idea, said Grandma. Lottie and Jack are going to love him. Grandma and Grandad were taking Lottie and Jack, their grandchildren, to the show. They knew nothing of the rocking horse their granddad had built for them. It was to be a very special surprise. Are you nearly ready? asked Grandma, putting on her best straw hat, the one with the cherries on it. I think I'll wear my old straw boater, announced Grandad, heading for the stairs. Before I move to the next page, what do you think a boater is? He says he'll wear his old straw boater. Hmm, take a look at the picture. Do you see anything made of straw in the picture? Do hurry, called Grandma. You don't want to be late for the judging. Grandad knelt down and pulled out the old leather suitcase that contained his straw boater, and there, Lying on the top of the case were his false teeth. Well, I never, he said. I've got my smile back. And Grandad needed it too. People filed past his rocking horse, nodding and smiling, remarking on how well made it was, and laughing out loud when they saw the teeth. Grandad felt very proud indeed. Judging was at three o'clock precisely, and Mr. Pilkington Smith, the judge, walked back and forth, twiddling his mustache thoughtfully as he considered the many excellent entrants for the craft section. The standard was very high, and choosing a winner was proving difficult. But eventually, Mr. Pilkington Smith stopped in front of Grandad and nodded his head. For sheer ingenuity and a sense of humor, he said with a broad smile as he pinned the red rosette to the rocking horse and handed a delighted Grandad the fine trophy. The crowd all cheered, and everyone had wanted the rocking horse to win, and none more so than Lottie and Jack, who were very excited, especially as they knew the rocking horse would be coming back home to live with them. Suddenly, a photographer appeared from the local paper and asked Grandad and his family to stand around the horse. Smile, please, he said, and Grandma smiled, Lottie and Jack smiled, the rocking horse smiled, 
but Grandad smiled the widest smile of them all. When the photographer had finished, Lottie put her arms around the rocking horse's neck to give him a big hug. Then she gazed inquisitively at his mouth. Grandad, she asked in a puzzled voice, are these your teeth? Grandma laughed and Grandad bent down and very confidentially told his small granddaughter, you should never look a gift horse in the mouth. And that brings us to the end of our first silly story. Now it's time for your independent work. Remember, we're focusing on making connections, so the three questions you'll be answering today all require you to make a connection to help explain your answer. Number one, think of a time you lost something important. How do you think Grandad was feeling when he lost his teeth? Explain. Number two, think of how people often feel about their pets. Why do you think Norman the African Grey Parrot was always perched on Grandad's bedhead? And number three, think of a time you received a special gift. How do you think Lottie and Jack felt about the rocking horse? Now for all of these questions, notice you're being prompted to think about something first. Then you're asked the question. So for the first one, when you have to think of something you lost, think about how you personally felt. How you felt is likely how Grandad felt. For the second question, where it says to think about how people feel about their pets, you can think about how you feel about your pets if you have any. If you don't, you can think about pet people you've seen with pets in real life or on TV. Then you can relate that to why Norman the African Grey Parrot was probably perched on Grandad's bedhead. And number three, when you have to think about the time you received a special gift. Think carefully about it. Maybe somebody made something for you by hand. Then relate that to how Lottie and Jack would have felt when they got that gift from their granddad. Please be sure to write neatly in your books and to write in full sentences. Check your spelling before you take a picture of your work and send it to me. All right, Year 5. As always, stay safe and I'll see you soon.